Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, you can be seated. So good to be with you. Uh, we have been hearing so much about all that God's doing here. I was down here a month ago and just went with Pastor Mark to get a tour of your new facility. And uh, just so encouraged, so encouraged by what God has done in just such a short amount of time with all of you guys. It really is profound. It's profound what God is doing in this church. It's profound what God is doing in this parking lot. The fact that you're building the church in a parking lot. Uh, when uh, Mark mentioned, I'm sad that I'm not in the room with you today, I'm like, we're not in a room. So I, it's, it feels like a stretch to say you're not in the room with us, but so good to be with you guys. I do want to encourage you that people, uh, uh, the testimony of what's happening here really is, is going out from this place and uh, encouraging the body of Christ. Uh, I absolutely don't just say this because I have to, but absolutely adore your pastors and uh, think that Mark and Rochelle are some of the greatest. I, they're, they're, they're the type of people that you hang out with, you laugh together, and you have fun. But I always leave. This is true. I'm not just saying this. I leave so full of faith. And actually, I, I kind of, you hang out, and then I'm like, I need more faith. That's what I realized. I think I'm not, I need to, I go back and I'm challenged, but just leave so full of faith and, and just want to believe God in our day. Believe God in our day for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So... It is an honor to be here. It's really great to be with you. My family sends their love. I have been married uh, 25 years this year. This year will be 25 years. I have a, um, I have a 23-year-old daughter, a uh, daughter that will just, just about to turn 20, and a son that's just about to turn 17. And so uh, that's my life right now. If you have your Bibles, I want you to get them out. We're going to go to, we're gonna go to Ephesians, not Exodus. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, then we're going to hang out at Ephesians chapter 4. So if you get your Bible, get it out. And uh, you need to start bringing your leather-bound Bibles. Can I just say right now, can I just say right now, your digital Bible doesn't count. It doesn't count. It's the Word of God, but I'm just, because this is, this is what I'm just telling you right now. Your digital Bible's not going with you to heaven. You know what's going to go to heaven with you? Your leather-bound Bible. That's going with you. Jesus is going to let that through. Actually, honestly, guys, I don't care what you read the Word of God on. Just read the Word of God. You can read the Word of God on, uh, on whatever you want. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Will you let me, uh, I was really kind of wrestling through what to share this morning. Always an honor and a privilege to be able to speak uh, at a church, and especially with friends. Not just to speak at a church, but to actually come with people that we just love so dearly and are in partnership with. Um, but will you let me be your pastor for a few minutes? Can I do that? Can I, can I share a pastoral word with you this morning? I'll tell you this, that at the end of the day, if you were to really ask me what I'm burning for, I want to see revival. Yes. I, 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 want to see, I want to see revival. I want to see revival in the nation. I want to see revival in California. I, uh, uh, man, our heart is burning to see California experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an awakening. I, I want to see a new Jesus people movement. And, uh, but, but I feel that if we're going to lean in and believe God for revival, I, I believe so deeply in the local church. And I believe that the local church is the vehicle through which revival comes. But I, but I believe if we're going to have this conversation, that it means that we have to stop. And I believe God wants to challenge and shift how we view the local church. I think that one of the gifts that has come out of this past season, it has it has disrupted church as we know it, and it has made us look once again at what is church, yeah. what's the purpose of church, what is the local church, yeah. how we're viewing it. And this matters because how you see church yes. matters. Right. The, the, how, you do, how you see something determines how you engage with it. Yeah. This is this really important to understand because we have to do the work around this thing. That if I see something improperly, if I see something incorrectly, then how I engage it and how I interact with it will be improper and incorrect. So, so I need to see something properly. I need to see something uh, with clarity if I'm going to engage it properly. And many people are engaging the church 
in a way that God did not intend it to be engaged because they're viewing it one way, even though God has another way for it. And this is, this is the challenge that I would give you. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4 in a few minutes. But Ephesians chapter 2 says this. Now, therefore, Paul's talking about when you get saved. Paul's talking about when you get redeemed. Paul's talking about when you, when you are taken from hell and put in heaven. When you're taken from the kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of light. When you've accepted the blood and the work of Jesus to stand righteous. This is what he says. He says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. That's good news. We're no longer on the outside. We're no longer strangers and foreigners, but here it is. But we are now fellow citizens with the saints and members, and then here's the phrase, of the household of God. Of the household of God. Here's where I believe God wants to shift our thinking. Here's where I believe God wants to challenge us coming out of this season of what the church really is, and it's this. The church is not a business, it's a family. The church is not a business and it's a family. That matters because if I view it as a business, I'm going to engage improperly with it rather than if I see it as a house or a family. One of the things I love, I love is um, I love customer service. Like, I love good customer service. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's, we, we, we've traveled to England and Europe a lot. And I, and I don't know if anybody's English here, but uh, dear Lord, they are the worst customer service nation in the world. It's, it's astounding how bad England and Europe is when it comes to customer service. It's like you're a hassle for being at their restaurant. Uh, it's like you're an inconvenience for spending money in their store. And so maybe it's just that I believe it's my God-given American right to have good customer service. But, but I love good customer service. And I'm not the guy who complains about it or throws a fit or talks to the manager if I don't get it. I just remember and don't come back. So if I go to a restaurant and I come into a restaurant and they sit me down and I'm sitting at the table for 10 or 15 minutes before the waiter or waitress comes over to check on me, give me some water, take my drink order, maybe bring a little, a little uh, 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 basket of uh, bread. If I'm sitting there 10 or 15 minutes, I don't throw a fit, I just remember. Yeah. <laughs> if when the waiter comes and takes my order and I specifically ask for there to be no tomatoes in my dish, because I can biblically prove from the book of Revelation that tomatoes are part of the Antichrist spirit. <laughs> Does anybody else agree with me on the issue of tomatoes? Yeah, I can. If, if I'm like, please don't put tomatoes in my dish. If they bring my meal out and there's tomatoes, I don't throw a fit. I don't complain. I don't argue. I push them off to the side. I just remember. Because I like good customer service. That's fine when it's at a restaurant. It becomes problematic when I act that way in my house. Now, let me just tell you right now, I, I, I have a holy fear of my wife. I'm scared of that woman. So I, just to let you know, I wouldn't do this in my house. But for sake of illustration, can you imagine if I came home one day after a long, hard day of ministry where I had to get coffee with a handful of people? <laughs> the fact that you're laughing at that joke makes me think this is literally what pastors do. Uh, and I come home from a hard day of work and I just want to, and I walk into my house. There's no hostess there for me, but that's okay. I'll let that one go. And I walk into my, in my dining room and I sit down at my dining room table. And then I wait patiently for somebody to come over, check on me, bring me some water and bring me some bread. And after 10 or 15 minutes, I'm a little bit frustrated because nobody's done that yet. So I'm just like, excuse me, is anybody going to come bring me some water? Like from all around the house. No, no. Get your own water. No. I cannot believe this. This is unbelievable. Can you imagine if I sat down at the table and my wife brought a meal? Again, I'm too scared to do this, but she brought a meal that, that she cooked and prepared and there was tomatoes in it. And I was like, I specifically asked for no tomatoes in my meal. I specifically asked there'd be no tomatoes. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine me getting up and going, I will never come back here ever again. I, this is, I am taking my business elsewhere. This is never, I cannot believe this. No, of course not. Because it's a house, not a restaurant. 
It's a house. It's a family, not a business. So you can, listen, if, when I see a restaurant for a restaurant, I'll engage with it. It becomes problematic when I view my house like a restaurant. And there's a lot of believers that are confused and frustrated and lost a little bit because they see the church as a business, not a family. And so they're interacting with it in a way that it was never intended to be interacted with. And if we're going to see revival, if we're going to actually see all that God's trying to do in California, it requires the work of, God, I want to see your church as I'm supposed to see your church so that I can interact with it properly. See, at our church, when we started, we began to kind of just give stories and illustrations because culture is created around kind of common stories you hold on to and illustrations and pictures. So I remember telling our church, I said, guys, I want every time we gather on Sunday to be like Thanksgiving. And here's why. Because Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. It wasn't always my favorite holiday growing up. It's become my favorite holiday since I got married. But it wasn't my, when I grew up, I grew up in a home, some of you relate to this. I grew up in a home that was just four of us. And I was not connected to my extended family. I have grandparents. I never really saw them. Like one, I saw one when I was five. Last time I saw another one was when I was eight. So I didn't have grandparents in my life. I didn't have aunts and uncles in my life. I didn't have cousins in my life, nieces and nephews. So it was me, my sister, my mom, and my dad. That was our holidays. So Thanksgiving was us sitting around a table, eating a meal. Christmas, I don't know if anybody comes from a smaller family. Christmas was this. We'd sit down, have all the gifts, and then my dad would open the gift. And we'd all watch my dad open the gift. He'd open the gift. (laughs) And then we'd look at it and we'd talk about it and we'd discuss it. We'd write a thank you note for it. And then we'd move on to my mom. And then my mom would open her gift and we'd talk about it and discuss it. That's how I grew up. And then I married my wife, CJ. And my wife, I wish you could know my wife. My wife comes, my wife is one big bundle of chaos. (laughs) Full of life, full of joy and just chaos. And she comes from a family. I come from a very structured, orderly family. My dad was a police officer. Uh, he, he, you know, everything's in order and everything's this. And then I married my wife. And, um, and she comes from a family that's massive family. Her grandparents were w- way involved in her life. Aunts, uncles, nephews, cousins, nieces. And not only that, Family's been married multiple times. So then there's, there's half siblings and step siblings and step, like it's just this massive family. We, everybody loves, we all love each other and it's just a big family. I remember when I first started dating her in 19, she brought me to Christmas for the first time. And I remember coming into Christmas at 19 with this woman, this girl that I'm wanting to marry. And I walk in and there was like 40 people in the living room. And I was like, what's going on right now? She goes, it's Christmas. What do you mean? What, yeah, what, do, what do I mean? What, who are all these people? She goes, this, this is my family. What are you talking about? I'm like, oh, okay. And I, re- I, remember, I remember going around just trying to, because literally like dad's been married a few times. Mom's been married twice. There's half, there's staff, there's all this stuff. So I'm like, well, who's that? And who's that? And I, I'm not making this up. I said, who's that guy? She goes, well, that's my brother, David. So I'm like, oh, okay, he's your brother. How is he your brother? Your mom's side, your dad's side? Like, what is it? And she goes, well, neither, really. I said, well, how is he your brother then? She goes, she's she, not making this up. She goes, you know, I don't really know. He just started coming around in high school. And we just started calling him brother. And now he comes to all the holiday events. And I was like, that's not even legal. You can't do that. What? So they give me a gift for Christmas. They come up, here's your gift. I'm like, thank you so much. And I start to open it and I look around and like 20 other people are opening gifts at the same time. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I haven't finished opening my gift yet. We haven't talked about it. We haven't discussed it. I literally am like, Am I about to marry into an anarchist family? What is going on right now? So, so because of that family, I experienced thanks, Thanksgiving in a way I've never experienced Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday now, but it was, I remember the first time I went, she brought me Thanksgiving and I come in and I mean, there are grandparents 
cousins, nieces, nephews, uncles, siblings, step, in like they're all there. They all show up and everybody's doing stuff. There's some people are cooking and setting up tables and kids are playing. And I walk in 19 years old and the new, you know, and I come in, it's a new guy. And they're like, I walk in and they go, hey, how you doing? And they handed me a bag of sweet potatoes, a bag of yams and a potato peeler. And I was like, I get, I guess I'm peeling potatoes. So I peel potatoes that first year. Come back to next year. They hand me a bag of sweet potatoes, yams, and a potato peeler. I guess I'm peeling potatoes. I'm 46 years old. I have two kids in college. I pastor a church. I've written multiple books. Do you want to know what I still do at Thanksgiving? Do you want to know what I still do? Oh, I, I, take, I take great pride in it now. I bring my own potato peeler now. It's from, it's from Japan. I got, a pota- I got a potato peeler from Japan. I'm thinking about making a holster for it. Like, like, I just show up because that's, that's what I do. I'm gonna, I peel potatoes. That's what I do on Thanksgiving. And you know what's craziest? I don't peel potatoes because I have a passion for potato peeling. I don't peel potatoes because I have a vision for potato peeling, because I have a mandate, because my heart has been stirred for potato peeling. I peel potatoes because that's just what we do to make this the best Thanksgiving ever. I have a passion for family, therefore I'm like, let's, let's do it. And I'm not over there like, like irritated. I'm peeling potatoes. I'm, look at the turkey carver. I'm, that's where I'm headed one day. I'm going to be a turkey carver. I started on the bottom, but I like, this is just, I don't even care. And you know what's crazy? Is nobody's ever said thank you to me for peeling potatoes. It's just, you know. And in my head, I, I, I do. Right. The, the, I, peel, I peel sweet potatoes and yams. And the favorite dish, uh, my wife's granny, she just passed away. She was 100. Wow. She, made, she made it to 100. Incredible woman. She had this sweet potato casserole kind of thing. And it's like the dish you want. So you go get that, then you get everything else. And people would be eating this. It's the thing for, and, and, and I'm sitting there, and this all happened in my head. And I'm like, yeah. you enjoying that? Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome, because those sweet potatoes did not peel themselves. <laughs> but you know what? Nobody's ever said thank you, and I'm not even offended. Because, because if this is a family, then it means we all just jump in and contribute. Guys, I'm going to actually get to the Ephesians 4, but listen to me on this. I'm going to get to Ephesians 4. But, but here's my deal. Guys, listen, I, I really I want to pastorally challenge you on this thing. There, as, if, if, we see it as, if we see it as a business, yes. we're, going to interact, we're going to interact wrong with it. Right. But if we see it as a family, then all of a sudden it's like, well, listen, I don't have a passion for children's ministry, right. but I serve in the children's ministry. Yes. Why? Because that's just what needs to happen for this to be a, the best Thanksgiving <laughs> gathering possible. Because it's family. It's just what we do. Even, even, because you're not going to really understand church if you can't. And, and, and I'm going to tell you this. Family has nothing to do with size. You're not a family church because you got 20 people. And you're not, not a family church because you got 2,000. Two like, it's a, it's a culture issue. But you're not going to understand, like, like, Jesus didn't come to redeem employees unto himself. Are you with me on that? He didn't come to redeem employees who are going to work for him. He came to redeem sons and daughters to be in right relationship with him and connected with one another. So, so when we're talking about, hey, jump in and serve, that makes sense. Is it raining? Um, did you say prayed away? That's prophetic. I'm not praying that away. <laughs> um, that is astounding. So, um, so 
It doesn't make sense because they're like, hey, jump in and serve. What are you looking for, employees? No, no, it's Thanksgiving. Everybody jumps and serves. You know, there's three types of people that don't serve. Three types of people that don't serve on Thanksgiving. This is only my introduction, by the way. We got some time. <laughs> three, three people that don't serve on Thanksgiving. One is the guest. They don't serve like you're a guest here. There's no need for you to serve. You're good. Some of you in this room, you're the guest. It's all right. Like, and, 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 that may, and you may be the guest for a while, and that's totally valid and okay. The second group is just the immature kids. They're little. Nobody gets mad at them. You're 10 years, they're nine years old. All they want to do is run around and play. They're only thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about the family. But that's okay. They're in our midst too. And we're fine. Like, now, it's not okay if you're, if you're 25 doing that, but nine it is, right? But, but the third group, and this is the part that's the one that's concerning and just weird. It's not like evil. It's just weird. And it's usually an uncle, is the guy on the couch who just is calling for people to bring him food while he watches the game. Like, no, no, like, no. So, but this doesn't make sense. If you see it as a restaurant, not a house. I'm not going into a restaurant. Like we went to dinner last night with, with, with Chris Estrada. I I wasn't at the restaurant last night and the guy didn't go like, Hey, any way you could help us bust that table over there. And could you maybe go back and cut some of that food up? And, and could you maybe like, no, like what? No, why, why, like, why would I do that? But, but if I'm at his house and I'm not just a guy, like we've known them for a long time. He's like, Hey, can you help pick up the table? Of course. Are you understanding what I'm saying? They're different contexts. So, so Paul, throughout Paul's writings regarding the church, if you really go look at it, are, are, are loaded with family imagery. Like you were born again into a household of God. So, so what we have to say is this, how do we view the church? And one of the ways we view the church is, is we need to see what's the purpose of the church. A lot of people have a lot of opinions on what the church is to be, but what's the purpose of the church? And one of the ways, you guys are really nervous about this rain, aren't you? No. Um, one, of the, one of the purposes, how do we determine the purpose? Well, you need to be able to look at the leadership structure that God put in place because the leadership structure gives insight into what the purpose of the church is. And the leadership structure is Ephesians 4. Paul's going to write the leadership structure, the fivefold ministry that, that Jesus gives. And what's the purpose of that? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Listen to this. So Christ himself gave, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. It's the fivefold leadership structure of the body of Christ. And here's why he gave them to us. To equip his people for the works of service. So, and then here's why. So that, and listen to the family imagery. The body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And here's the family language. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth, by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, here it is again, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. The church is a family, not a business. And the fivefold ministry has been given to us for this reason, to mature you. The whole game is this, God's trying to mature your life. And maturity looks like you looking like Jesus. Maturity is this. Your life looks more like Jesus this year than it did last year. The fruits of the Spirit, the fruits, the evidence of the activity of the Holy Spirit, who is sanctifying, renewing your life to look like Jesus every day, is more evident this year than it was last year. That's the whole game. The church is a family whose job is to mature people. But when I view it, here's the problem with you as a business, because the nature of a business is to sell you something. The nature of a business is to sell you something. And, and here's where it gets confusing. Because see, one of the things I want to tell you, I love that there's a consumer mindset that, that I actually love. I love consumer culture. 
Do you know why? Because consumer culture is built around removing struggles. So I love that there's a whole team of people at Google that are literally just saying, how can I make Banning's life easier? God bless them. God bless them. I love that some guy somewhere is like, let's figure a way out to get men not to have to actually go grocery shopping. We'll do it for them. You pull up to a little stall number one. We'll bring the, the we'll bring all the groceries out. You don't even have to talk to us. Push a button, thing comes up. I'll put it in and I leave. I'm like, God bless. God bless whoever came up with that idea. Like, I, I love that. But the problem is, is that consumer culture is trying to remove the struggle so that you will give them money. They're in competition for money. So here's, here's, here's how it happens. If there's two coffee shops that are a block apart, they're in competition for your money. So what, so what they do is one, one owner sitting there one day and he's in his, he's in his coffee shop and he sees a guy pull up. Guy gets out of his car, walks in, stands in line, orders a coffee, stands waiting for the coffee, gets the coffee, doesn't stay in the coffee shop, goes back out to his car and leaves. Well, the owner goes, I think I can eliminate some of the struggle of getting coffee for you by putting a drive through in. It really is raining. Um, and so, so, I love that sound. So, um, but now, now I just want to, now I just want to get a book and go sit by a fire. <laughs> so, so now all of a sudden people are shopping, are, 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 are going to get coffee at this coffee shop, not because the coffee's better, but because it's easier and more convenient because he removed a struggle. This is consumer culture. The problem is not with consumer culture. The problem is, is that consumer culture doesn't stay in the coffee shop. It moves into the church or it moves into family. I love consumer culture out there. I hate consumer culture in the church and I hate it in my own family. I don't like it in my own family either. I don't like my kids sitting around thinking their mom is their personal maid and waitress and everything else. I'm like, that's, it's family. What are you, what are you talking about, son? Get up and go get your own food. Problem is my son is the baby of the family and my wife is like, I'm like, CJ, you have to stop doing everything for him. He'll just be upstairs FaceTiming her. Can you bring me something to drink? She's like, you bet. I'm like, no. But here's, but here's, but here's, here's where we get really confused. Because in the world, consumer culture says this. Life should be easy. There should be no struggle. It should be comfortable. Are you comfortable? Well, you should be comfortable. If you buy this product, you'll be more comfortable. Is life inconvenient? It shouldn't be inconvenient, so we'll make it more convenient. But the problem is, is that Jesus is not concerned about your convenience. He, he's, not, he's not concerned about your comfort. The pro, we, we have associated in the church that, that, that comfort and convenience equate, equal good, discomfort and inconvenience are bad. But Jesus doesn't think like that at all. Jesus is like, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. You're not going to have, like foxes have holes, but you're not going to have a place to lay down your head. If you want to, you got to sell it all. Like this is the gospel Jesus, this is what my pastor Bill says. He says that, he says that Jesus is not inf- interested in your comfort. He's interested in your growth. And so, so struggle is a part of your growth. Struggle doesn't make sense at the restaurant, but it makes sense in the family. Because parents understand that struggle is that this is the, the story of the emperor moth. If you heard the story of the emperor moth, it's just a, a man found a, an emperor moth in a cocoon and the emperor moth was trying to struggle to get out. He felt bad. So he cut a little slit. The emperor moth easily emerged from the cocoon, but he came with a bloated body and little shriveled wings. And the man thought, well, eventually he'll fly, but he never did because he didn't. What he didn't understand was this, was that God created the struggle of the cocoon to force the blood from the body 
to the wings and that when we eliminate struggle, we're actually stopping people from getting to the place of freedom in their life. So, but here's, here's, where, it get, here's where it gets so hard. We live in a consumer culture and we want to bring it to the church. So we walk into the church and we're like, man, this is a struggle. I need you to fix this for me. People all the time in our church are like, I've been here for six months. I haven't found community yet. It's been really hard. I'm like, yeah, community's a struggle. <laughs> Normally, everybody else wants to go, oh my gosh, let me fix that for you. And let me, let me get you community. And I want prayer to be as easy as possible. I want community to be as easy as possible. I don't want you to be inconvenienced at all. And, 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 I, want, and I want this. And I want serving to be as easy as possible. And, and Jesus is like, no, listen, the struggle, but you don't get that unless you're family. Wow. I understand the struggle that my kids are going through are actually what's growing them and maturing them to actually be healthy adults. It, but, but, so, but the problem is some of us are confused. We come to the church and go, why is community a struggle? It's part of how you get to health. It's part of how you grow. Why is prayer inconvenient? Because everything around me is trying to tell me that nothing should be inconvenient, everything should be comfortable, and there should be no struggle. And guys, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, but you live in the capital of consumer culture in the world. Guys, you have valet parking at your airport. So it's like, uh, it's such a hassle to park over there and walk. No, I don't mind it in the world, right? But you just have to understand, we get confused because you're like, why? I've been here for a year and I still haven't found community. Yeah, press in. Come on. Community is a struggle. It's not always easy. So you don't always find it right off the bat. You don't always figure that out. And you know what? God's going to use this stuff to grow you. The goal... So, so, so if, the goal, if the nature of business is to sell you something, the nature of family is to create an environment where you grow. The goal, the, goal, the goal is completely different. Success in a family is this. I had sons and daughters who matured and grew to become fathers and mothers, who had sons and daughters who grew and matured to become fathers and mothers, who had sons and daughters. That's just the nature of it. And, and, and we are, I understand my number one job as a parent is to make sure my three kids are maturing and growing physically, emotionally, spiritually, educationally, relationally, that they're growing. And when they stop growing, it's a problem. Again, I'm just trying to show you this. This is what Paul says. The fivefold has been given to you to mature you and grow you so that you're no longer an infant. That is a family concept. Families naturally do that. So if you can imagine my 16-year-old, he's almost 17, when he was nine, if he physically stopped growing, I would be talking to my wife and say, what's going on? I, I, don't, I don't know why he stopped growing. Why isn't he growing right now? I don't know. Yes. We say, all right, we need to call the doctor. Let's have a phone call and bring him in. And you know who would be concerned? His grandparents. Yeah. I'd be calling his grandparents. I don't know what's going on with Lake. He's not growing. Yeah. And his grandparents and his aunts and his uncles yeah. and his cousins and his siblings. And we take him in. You know, when we take him home from the doctor, they'd all call. What, what do you say? What's going on? Why isn't he growing? What's happening? Because my job is to make sure he grows. My job is to make sure he matures. And then we come into the church and you should have people around you that are like, Joel, what's going on, my man? You haven't grown in the last six months. I just saw your interaction with your wife and that interaction is the same interaction you had a year ago. Why haven't you grown? People are like, whoa, man, get out of my business. Why are you in my business right now? No, because you should look more like Jesus this year. You should look more like Jesus in your marriage. You should look more like Jesus this year in your marriage than you did last year. That's the whole, per that, and, and so the church, that's what this is. But the problem is, this is really astounding. Um, the, the problem is, is this, is, is that 
we don't, we don't, I'm, I'm wanting to challenge the mindset that we fall into that we don't even realize we fall into. Because we come to the church expecting the church to do our Christian life for us. When, when, when you got saved, you became a follower of Jesus. So you get with Jesus and Jesus says, hey, follow me. And here's what I want. I want you to be somebody who prays. I want you to be somebody who gives. I want you to be somebody who takes care of the poor and the orphan and the widow. I want you to be somebody who shares your faith. I want you to be somebody who disciples other people. I want you to be somebody, right? This is what it is. So this is the call that every single one of us have. So I get that call. And the problem is, is I take that call. I take that responsibility. And I come into the church and I say, would you do this for me? Because that's what I do at a restaurant. I show up to a restaurant. I'm like, you know what I'd love for you to do? Is I'd love for you to cook because I don't want to cook. I'm I'm literally here because I don't want to do what you're about to do for me. So then give, pray, share your faith, disciple. And we come to church and we're like, hey, I, I think you should be doing that for me. I mean, I tithe. So I'm not sure what I'm getting in return for my tithe. But what I'd like is some good customer service. That's what I'd like. So I want you to do my Christian life for me. It's a little bit like, I remember the first time, um, I, I, if I could unpack this more, I can't for a second time with my wife. Yeah, but, but they, we, um, my wife, she's just, like I said, a, a, um, a massive bundle of joy and, um, and chaos. And so one of the things she loves is she has dogs and she loves her dogs. And she has this one dog, his name's Dash. He's an 11-year-old golden retriever and she loves this dog. Like literally if our house was on fire and she had to save one of us, she'd be like, Manning, it's been a good ride, but, uh, but I'm saving my dog. And uh, uh, I can find another husband. I can't find, you know. So you think I'm kidding and I'm not kidding at all. Uh, but when that dog was a puppy, it just a nightmare. It just chewed everything. Every time the door was open, he'd run out the door, run down the street. Yeah. We'd never walk on a chain because he'd choke himself, dug everything, ate everything. So finally, about a year old, I said, CJ, I can't do this anymore. We have to get this dog trained. So I was at PetSmart and saw that they had a group class, $180 for 10 sessions. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm gonna do this. So I take the dog in for the first time and I take the dog in and he won't even walk in good. From the car to this class, he was choking himself. He's pulling so hard <laughs> the whole way. I'm like trying to hold on to him. He's just choking himself. We get in, I sit down. He's, sit, he's sitting next to me just like, just gagging, dry heaving because he choked himself from the car to the thing. The lady walks in, the dog trainer walks in and she begins the class and, as, and, and we're about 10 minutes in and I notice that she's not talking to my dog, she's talking to me. And I was like, I don't know why you're talking to me. I am not the problem. I am not the one digging up and running and like, like but I thought it's an intro class. I come back to next week and, I, and she's, she wasn't talking to my dog, she was talking to me. I got so, I, did, I, I, stopped, I didn't go back. I got so irritated because I realized, oh, you actually are trying to train me to train my dog. I said, I didn't show up to this class to get trained. I showed up to this class for you to fix my dog. Fix my dog. I need you to get my dog to walk on a leash. I need you to get my dog to stop digging. I need you to get my dog to stop. Like I came here and paid you money so that you would fix my dog. Stop talking to me and fix my dog. Welcome to church. Like, we, I, I, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be harsh right now. I'm not trying to be harsh. But if we're going, if we're saying, God, we want to see you move in Orange County. We want to see you move in California. Then we have to look at how we're doing church. We have to look at how we're approaching church. And, and so we've got our Christian life, our responsibility, and we're coming to church going, hey, because the Bible says this, that fivefold has been given to equip you, to encourage you, to mature you, not to do your Christian life for you. Do you know how, when we first started the church, we started the church, and when we started, it was like, um, 
When we started, it, it was, you know, there, a lot of people came. We had a name, a bunch of worship leaders. We came from Bethel, so a whole bunch of people came, and they were believers. They weren't like yeah. the lost coming. It was a whole bunch of people that had been to church, and we didn't have much going on. We had Sundays going on, and we didn't, we, like, we have structure now. We've got small groups and all that, but we didn't have a dead. People, and I, I was so astounded at believers who had been in church a long time. They'd come up to me and say, hey, how do I get plugged into community around here? Yeah, right, right. And we didn't have a small group structure, so it's like, uh, invite somebody over to your house for dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, wait, what? No, 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 no. Like, what kind of small group structure you got going on so I can find community? I'm like, we don't have any. Like, just take somebody to Starbucks. And I remember that I was astounded. I'm like, are you telling me that you don't know how to do community unless I build something for you? Are are, are you trying to tell me that, that, that your mandate to follow Jesus can only happen if I build something for you? I'm not talking about the immature believers right now, right? I'm talking about, we're talking about mature believers. People might come up and be like, my neighbor just got saved. Where's the new believers class? In your living room. And guess who the leader is? I anoint and commission you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go disciple your neighbor. Because my job is not to disciple your neighbor. My job is to equip you and mature you so that you can be an effective discipler of your neighbor. Are you with me on this? Same thing. People come up all the time. They're like, hey, what's our church do for the poor? What they want to know is what's the 501c3 organization do for the poor? And I'm like, what's our church doing for the poor? I'm like, I don't know. What are you doing for the poor? I, I listen, I'm not opposed to programs and structures. I'm not opposed to any of that type of stuff. But sometimes we need to challenge this type of stuff. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what everybody in our church. Because here's the question. Here's a sign of maturity. Because here's, here's where you know the maturity is happening. It's called personal responsibility. I don't, I, don't, I don't need the church to do my Christian life for me. I need the church to cover me, equip me, encourage me, grow me. But this is the thing of like, this, this is a question. If your church did nothing for the poor, would you still lean in and say, God, you've called me to take care of the poor. What am I going to do about that? And, and this, is, this is honestly one of the main reasons. I'll just end with these two things. I believe that one of the ways that we're going to have massive impact is when we can have this shift because family requires personal responsibility. My son does not have a maid. His room's a mess. It's his responsibility. That's family. That's not a hotel. I am irritated when I get back from speaking in the morning or afternoon and I get back to my hotel and it still hasn't been cleaned. I'm irritated by it. But at home, I don't walk into my house at home and go, why are these clothes still on the floor? Why is that bed still unmade? Because you haven't done anything about it is why. But here's, here's, but here's what I think. So, so many of us, personal responsibility is so big because what happens is, is we think it's somebody, one of the reasons why we're not seeing cities impacted is because we think it's somebody else's responsibility. It's somebody, it's somebody else's responsibility to pray. It's somebody else's responsibility to share. It's somebody else's responsibility to reach that realm of call. It's somebody else's responsibility. I drove, I went to school here in Orange County, Costa Mesa at Vanguard. And I remember one time I was driving home with my friend. It was, I was driving to Reading, 10 hours, just I-5. And it was me, I, I, it was my friend driving his truck. I was in the middle. Pete was, was uh, I mean, Steve was a passenger. Pete, me, and Steve in this truck. We get up about to Williams. We're an hour and a half from Reading. And uh, we pull over to get gas. Pull up, pull up to the gas station, pull up to the gas pump. Uh, uh, Pete gets out. He goes in and pays for the gas. I get out. I go get some snacks. Steve goes to use the restroom. We're there for a little bit. Finish all up. Get back on the road. And we're about 15 minutes down the road, and the car just all of a sudden lurches to a stop. We coast over to the side. We're sitting on the side of the road. And I'm like, what's going on? Pete goes, I don't know. My truck's never broke down. I don't know what happened. We look at, like, the, the oil gauge, heat gauge. It's all fine. And I look at the gas gauge, it's on empty. And I said, Pete, did you get gas at the gas station? He goes, no, I went in and paid for it. I thought Steve was getting it. 
We both look at Steve. Steve, did you get gas at the gas station? He goes, guys, I was using the restroom. I thought Banning was getting it. They both look at me. I'm like, don't look at me, guys. I was getting snacks. I thought Pete put it in. We had pulled up to the gas station, paid for the gas, used the restroom, got snacks, got back in the car and left, never putting gas in. Because all of us thought somebody else was going to do it. All, all of us thought, well, somebody else will pray, right? Yeah. Wow. Somebody, somebody's praying for Orange County, right? Wow. Somebody's reaching my neighbors, right? So, somebody's, somebody's like, take, like, this is what happens. Right. But family goes, yes. oh, like my pastor's reaching my city, right? Wow. I mean, I'm not sure what he's getting paid for, but I, it should be to reach my city and do my job, right? But, but family goes, but it won't, listen, it won't make sense if you don't see this family. It won't make sense because this is not a restaurant. <laughs> if you go to a restaurant, they're like, hey, anyway, you, uh, you ordered a steak. Anyway, you go make, back and then make that. What? No. But when I go to my house, it's my responsibility. It's not, it's not somebody else's responsibility to do this. Uh, I'll just end with this. We'll pray for some people. But I actually think that family is going to be a massive part of the harvest. Yes. This has nothing to do with church size for me. It has to do with culture. It has to do with... Um, we even say this type of stuff. Do you know that if you really begin to view it as a family, you know, you have greeters. We have ushers and greeters and different things. Do you realize that, I love that we have that ministry, we have that ministry too, but you know it's not just their responsibility to make people feel welcome. That if this was actually a house, I don't care what your personality is. If you're hosting a gathering at your house, everybody that walks through that door is gonna make sure they're, they're welcome, they're loved. Nobody's gonna sit by themselves ever. And so we all come into an environment and we're looking around going, and you see somebody that's sitting by themselves. There should be eight people that go like, hey, are you here by yourself today? Come sit with me real quick. That's not the, well, well that's, the, that's the greeter's responsibility. But I was going to say this, that I think that family, family is the most, attra- healthy family is the most attractive thing, I believe, on the planet. And if, you, and if you come from a dysfunctional home, you will get this. If you come from a dysfunctional, unhealthy home, if you have that one friend who had a healthy home, you wanted to be there. I'm going to throw my mom under the bus, but she's not here. So my mom was not a morning, she's not a morning person. So I grew up, I know you're going to feel bad for me. I grew up having to make my own breakfast. And uh, middle class struggle was real. And so I just have cold cereal every morning. Yes. But a few, a few streets over, my best friend, Peter Shelley, middle school, I'm in seventh grade, my best friend, Peter Shelley, his mom would wake up every morning and he would come out of his room at 6.30 in the morning, walk down the hallway into the kitchen where there was a hot breakfast waiting for him. I'm a different every day. Bacon and eggs, waffles, biscuits and gravy, pancakes like just and I remember as in my house a seventh grade co- confident little kid got my cereal and I thought Peter is having a hot meal so I went out got on my bike rode to his house didn't knock didn't even ask literally put my bike down in the driveway Walked in the door, said, what's up, Peter? Hello, Mrs. Shelley. And I went and sat down at the table. <laughs> they never said anything. And I, I started going over to their house every morning for breakfast. <laughs> I just started showing up at their house because they got a hot breakfast and I'm going to be there. They never said anything to me. I don't even know what happened. All I know is I said, what's going on? Hey, good morning, Mrs. Shelley. What's up, Peter? What are we having for breakfast? <laughs> and I would just sit down as a little middle school kid. This is it. I, I'm just telling you, people, people are attracted to healthy family. They want to be around healthy family. 
They don't want to be around a corporation. They don't want to be around a business. They want to be around people who are yeah. believing each other and for each other and serving one another and jumping in and being involved. Like, and I really think that this is what people are longing for that they don't even have words for. We stand up with me real quick. Stand up with me. I want to take a... F- oh, man, I just... Guys, I, I believe so strongly that what God is doing at Ocean's Church, God wants to impact this entire region. He wants to do what even that video at the very beginning just wants to plant these churches all around the world. But it's a, it's a community of people who say, we're going to be family. Not because everybody knows me. Not because my pastor goes to dinner with me every week. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that thing that says we're going to come and serve one another. We're not here just to be at a restaurant. We're here because we're showing up at a house together. And I'm not inviting people to a restaurant. I'm inviting people to Thanksgiving. I'm inviting people to a family. Hey, the guy wearing the cat shirt, what's your name? Yeah, don't look at how many cat shirts you think are behind you. <laughs> how many? It's a caterpillar shirt. How many? You're like, oh, is there a bunch of guys behind me wearing the cat shirt? What's your name? Ricardo? Man, would you stretch your hands out to Ricardo real quick? Ricardo, I don't, I don't know. Did you grow up in church? Kind of, off and on. Man, there's just such a just such a call in your life. I, I just I just I just feel the pleasure of the Lord over you. I just I see the Lord as like a dad, just so proud of you. Like I see the Lord just as a father in your life, just looking at you and going, I'm so proud of you. Like I just you just make his heart so happy. I think that you fought for certain things. You fought, you fought uh, to, to be the man you are. You fought to stay committed in areas where maybe uh, it would have been easier not to be committed to. There's a deep, deep loyalty on your life. And, and you've really fought. And I think there's, price, there's prices that you've paid that nobody would know you've actually paid those prices. There's decisions you've made that have cost you, that haven't been easy, that have been done in private. And the Lord sees them. And the Lord is proud of you. And the Lord just says, man, you bring so much pleasure to my heart. I just, I just saw even like, like, a, like a, it was like a sporting event and, and you had done something. And I just saw the Lord standing up in the stands and just yelling, that's my boy. That's my boy. And I saw, I saw you kind of in this mode and I just see breakthrough over you. Like there's a, there's a breakthrough. I don't, I don't know what you're needing. I don't know the prayers you're praying. I can just tell you, I saw in massive words over you breakthrough. And there's a season of breakthrough, and you're going to see the Lord come through in some areas. You're going to see breakthrough in areas. I saw, I saw breakthrough in finances. I saw breakthrough in relationships. I saw, I saw breakthrough in some areas that that um, have been maybe broken or disconnected. I just saw the Lord said, I saw the Lord said, I'm about to mend some broken things. I'm about to restore some things that have been lost. I felt like there's been some things that have been lost that the Lord is going to restore. Some things that have been frayed and broken that the Lord's going to mend back together. So we just bless you in the name of Jesus. So grateful for you real quick. Hey, is that a pink dress? Is that a pink dress, salmon dress, some type of dress? What's your name? Katie? Man, stretch your hands out to Katie real quick, would you? Come on, Ocean's Church. We go Pentecostal. Come on, Ocean's. Man, I, I just I just see over your life just a. Uh, I just feel the Lord's going to bring. There's a. Um, I saw uh, insecurity not in your not over your whole life, but in the area of leadership in particular. Like not that not that like you live an insecure life all the time, but I saw like the Lord really going, hey, I'm going to start dealing with this thing of insecurity around leadership and really what you believe your call is and really the authority that you carry. There's a real intentionality on your life. I just, I think that, I think that you have so much more to offer. Again, I don't, this is not your whole life, right? I'm talking about in this one area. 
that you have so much more to offer than you think. And I saw some people coming around you really speaking into that thing. And you were having a hard time believing them a little bit. But there is something on your life that's unique. There's something on your life that's special. There's something on your life that you carry that not a lot of people carry. But I just saw that there's been a real attack against the confidence issue with that. That there's just been attack around that you felt insecure in some leadership stuff. You felt insecure around, do I really have that authority? And can I really do that? And I just, I just heard the Lord saying, I have given you something so unique and it's just missing. And I, I just feel like, I feel like when you're around, people are better. Like people are better when you're there. Uh, environments are stronger when you're there. Like there's just a real like, um, like, like uh, people just saying, that I don't know what it is, but I'm just better when you're here. Like things are better and there's just something you carry. And I just really heard the Lord say that it is missing when you are not there. I just, I just heard the Lord saying it is missing when you are not there. And I just heard him say, I need you there. And I am going to come and deal with that insecurity thing. I am going to come and deal with it. And I just heard the Lord just, just really come. And I just, as a father too, man, I saw the Lord coming to you as a father as well. And really beginning to speak some, some courage into you in some areas, some boldness. And it's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel weird. I actually saw it feeling wooden for you. Like you beginning to step into some confidence. Confidence, you actually begin to step in. I actually just, I just heard the Lord said, you can fake it till you make it. Like I just, I just heard the Lord say that your feelings may not line up with what you're about to do, but that you can step out in confidence and, uh, and it's going to feel raw. I, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw you stepping out in some areas and, and you felt exposed and you just felt raw and it felt vulnerable, I guess. And the Lord just said, listen, trust me on this. I'm going to cover you on this. And, and I just, there's something so unique on your life that is just missing when you're not there. And, and people are stronger because of you. Better, they're better because of that with you. Yeah, amen. One more last one real quick. The lady in the middle in the pink shirt that maybe has flowers too with the glasses. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm talking to. What's your name? Ma- Maddie? Patty, Patty. And are you with anybody today? Okay, that's your husband next to you? That's your husband to my left? Yeah, just stretch your hands out real quick. And I just saw, I just saw like you've taken territory in the spirit. I just saw that the Lord, the Lord just said she's taken territory in the spirit. She's fought for things. I, I just saw, I actually saw that you've kind of shifted uh, lineage. Uh, you've shifted kind of uh, uh, all those that are coming after you, that, that, they're, that you've done something that shifted things. That, 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 that like, like, like generations after you, we'll be able to kind of trace back uh, uh, that there was some territory that you took and, and it's yours now and you're going to give it. And I, I just heard the Lord say what she's paid a great price for, she's going to find great joy in giving away for free. I saw, I saw like, I saw people coming around you. I saw people coming around you and you breaking off pieces of your life things that have cost you dearly, things that you paid a great price for. I saw you giving them away for free to people as they were coming around you. And, um, and, and there's just something, um, I saw a convergence as well. Um, I, I don't know all you do or what's happening, but I saw that the Lord just said there's three streams that are about to come together and she's about to experience the force of what, that, that I, I feel like all that's been happening in your life and all, in all honesty, I feel like all, I, I, I see these kind of three distinct seasons in your life, these three distinct kind of streams that have happened in your life and the Lord just said all of this has been for this moment right here where I'm about to bring these three streams together and she's going to experience what it is to really I have the full force of a river flowing. I saw that the impact, 
over the next decade is going to outweigh everything that's happened before. That, that the, next, the next decade is going, because of this, because of, it's almost like the Lord's putting to everything that the Lord's done in your life. It's almost like it's culminating into this thing where the Lord says, we're, let's, let's go. We're about to see something happen. And, uh, and I, there's just a real humility on your life. There, there's a real, like, uh, uh, you, you don't need to be in the spotlight. You're, you're kind of okay just in the background, do what you do. And, uh, um, but I just, I just see a real fierce warrior thing on you, that you go get territory in the spirit, that the Lord's about to bring some, some things together. Uh, I also saw the Lord come into you. I, I, don't, I, I think it has to do with uh, relationships or people. or there, I just see you carrying some people in your heart. And uh, I saw the Lord coming to you as he did blind Bartimaeus. And he said, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? Wow. And I saw the Lord coming and I, and I feel like you need to be specific with him. And, uh, and I saw you bringing some people that you've been carrying in your heart. There's, there's, there's just people, I don't know, I, there's, there's specific people that you've been carrying in your heart. And I just heard the Lord coming and saying, what is it that you want me to do with them? What is it that you want? And I just saw, I saw you boldly coming forward and said, Lord, this is what I'm asking for. And I really believe that the Lord's going to give you a sign. He's going to back up what I'm saying in the next week. He's going to show you some things that's just going to confirm this thing in the name of Jesus. I'm going to turn this over to pastor. And I know people have been watching online. I know we've gone long this morning, but father, we just pray God that you would make this house a family, that this would be a place where prodigals can come home to, that people can mature and grow, that we could see cities impacted, shift our mindset, God. Come on, so good. Can we thank pastor Banning for an incredible message? So good. So good. Remain standing just for a moment. We're going to pray one last prayer. Go ahead and close your eyes just for a minute. Man, every single week at Ocean's Church, we want to give people an opportunity to make a decision. Like even that Pastor Banning was talking about today. We're talking about family and, and family dynamics and a healthy family. Well, Jesus is here offering an invitation for you to join his family. And even, please, please don't, please don't leave. Keep your eyes closed just for a moment. This is important. This is special. Man, I just even heard uh, God speaking to me that this was going to be a day, a marker day, that you'll be able to tie in the day that it rained on a Sunday. Because we know this, it's rare for us. Man, I was in the tent. Pastor Benny was there. It was raining outside and God did a great work in and through my life. So all over the room with your eyes closed. Man, we had tons of people first service at both campuses. I know there's a lot of people watching online that are going to make this decision as well. But with your eyes closed, you would say, you know what? Um, today's the day that I want to make a decision that I want to join the family of Jesus. I want to partner with what he's doing in my life. Maybe you're far from God. Maybe you've never known him. I want to let you know this is for you today. You know who you are. Maybe your story is like mine. I grew up in church. I knew I knew what I knew it was right, but I ran away from church when I was in high school. Did whatever I wanted to do with whoever I wanted to do it with. And I had a moment where God encountered me and I came back home. So whether that's you for the very first time or you're making a decision and you say, Pastor Joel, I want to come back home today. I want to join that family relationship with Jesus. With every eye closed on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Listen to me. It is my honor to introduce you to my best friend. So all over the tent and even online, on the count of three, if that's you, one, come on, I see hands already, two, three, say that's me, go ahead and lift your hands, go ahead and lift your hands, that's amazing, come on, put them up, put them up high so I can see in the back, awesome, I see one, two, come on, anybody else, three, thank you, sir, that's amazing, come on, Ocean Church, can we give a big hand clap, that's incredible. If you're watching online right now, we want you to go ahead and write the word heart, H-E-A-R-T, or you can put the little heart emoji. We have people in our chat online who are ready to pray for you. Oh, sisters, you know that every single week there's people on Facebook and YouTube that are typing out, I want to give my life to Jesus. So we're so proud of you even watching, watching online. With those three people in the room and everybody online, oh, sisters, can we pray this prayer? Say, dear Jesus, I want to join the family. Won't you move into my life? Lead me and guide me from this day forward. I love you, Jesus. Come on, everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, one more time, big hand clap for all that God's doing in and through Ocean's Church.